Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 17. Follow along, we'll read the entire chapter. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. <clears throat> I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. By the way, that's as long as any of us will be here till we finish the work he gave us to do. And then we can go home. Evidently, we're not done yet. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Just a side note, Roger Nicole in commenting on this, someone was asking him, doesn't God love everybody in the world? He says he doesn't even pray for everybody in the world, much less die for everybody in the world. He prays for those that you have given me. All are mine, all are my, all, I got my nose fixed and now my mouth stopped working. And all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should keep them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. The word of the Lord. And let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you attend this exposition of your word with the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And may we love Christ more when we leave here than we did when we got here. For Jesus' sake, amen. 
The key verse for us is verse 24. Father, I desire that those whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. This prayer in John 17 is often referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ, but really it should actually be called the Lord's Prayer. That prayer in Matthew 6 is Christ's pattern for our prayer life rather than the Lord's Prayer. This is actually his praying. And in this prayer, there are only a few petitions, which makes it vastly different than ours. Most of our prayer is all petition. Jesus just has a few. He prays first for himself and for his own glory, and that's in verses 1 to 5. Then he prays for his people to the end of the chapter, verse 6 through verse 25. And verse 24 is the last of those few petitions. I want us to notice here who it is he prays for. Those whom you gave me. The blessing he prays for regarding them, that they may be with me where I am. Now think for a moment, where was Christ when he prayed this? He was going to the garden, going to his agony, to be taken that night, to be crucified the next morning, and laid in his grave the next evening. But here, Christ prays as if he was already in heaven. Verses 11 to 12, I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. And then he prays that his people will be with him in heaven. He loved them so much that he came to the world where they were. He loved them so well that he endured what they deserved. The modern uh, hymn writer said this, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. So Christ paid a debt he didn't deserve. And here he expresses his love in desiring that they may be with me where I am. It is imperative for Christ that he and his people be together. And then we see why Christ prays for this blessing on his people, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. Why does Christ want his people with him in heaven? So that we can behold his glory. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that must be like to close your eyes in death and the next second you open them, there's Jesus in all of his glory. Modern songwriter wrote a song by that name, I Can Only Imagine. You really can't. I mean, if you stop and think about that for a minute, what's it going to be like to see him face to face, all glorious. Now we will receive a glory of our own to be sure. We have some of it already. Verse 22, the glory which you gave me I have given them. That's a lot of glory. And we will receive much more in heaven, but the glory of Christ's people consists of and is advanced by beholding His glory. Of all the things Christ could have prayed for. Now interestingly enough, the disciples had beheld Christ's glory before. In John chapter 1, he says, We beheld His glory. The the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Or in 2 Corinthians 3, We all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Isaiah saw his glory in Isaiah 6 and made him fall on his face. So why does Christ speak of the necessity of his people being with him where he is that they may behold his glory? Because he can manifest it anywhere and since we can behold it anywhere. It's because we see very little of it. Our light is small, our eyes are weak. But in the day that Christ prays for, the manifestations of his glory will be greater. 
Think back to the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transfigured. They couldn't look at him. But in heaven, you will be able to look at him. Full face. There is a uh, song I like to watch on YouTube. It's called All Rise. And I can't recommend it highly enough. I sent it to Frank and to Chris, and they both appreciated it a lot. The one you should watch is with a Swedish tenor named Jacob with a K, Stenberg. There's about a 300 voice choir behind him. And I only watch it probably 15 times a day and I still get chills every single time. All rise to stand before the throne in the presence of the Holy One. That's what's coming. That's what you and I can look forward to. To stand before the throne in the presence of the Holy One. Note the argument Christ uses with God regarding the blessing he's praying for on his people. For you loved me from before the foundation of the world. Now that phrase is a common scripture phrase for eternity. For the foundation of the world and time began together. So the Lord's argument is this. You loved me from eternity. And that has a mighty force behind it. Christ is saying, you loved me. I love them and I want them with me where I am. They love me and they want to be with me where I am. You love them and want them where I am. See the circular reasoning there. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as entrusted with the office of a Savior and charged with the Chosen, was and is the object of the Father's eternal delight and love. And it's on the basis of that love that the salvation of all the elect stands more firm than the pillars of heaven and earth. Now, from this little glance, I hope you can see what a treasure chest of truth there is in this prayer. But the primary thing in the text I want us to see is the manner of Christ praying. Notice how he starts his prayer. I desire or I will. Nowhere in scripture do we ever read of anyone praying like this. Some, scripture, some in scripture have been very familiar with God and God has encouraged them by his condescension to them. But there's nothing like this I will in any of their prayers. Abraham was very intimate with God. He was the first believer honored with the name, the friend of God. Yet he pleaded for Sodom in Genesis 18 with deep humility. And when he pleaded for Ishmael in Genesis 17, he said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Great saints in their greatest prevailings with God and blessings from him are still lowly, humble believers. And no believer ever does or ought to speak like this to God. We should always ask according to his will and forget and deny our own will, yet Christ said, I will. He doesn't say, may I please make such and such a request. He doesn't say, well, I know that you're in charge and you have the final say about these matters. No, he asserts himself here like he does nowhere else. And he does it on our behalf and for our salvation. He says to God, this is what I desire. This is what I want. I want these people to be with me. I want them to see me in my glory, which means they must be where I am glorified eternally. He says, this is what I want. He doesn't, well, this is what I want, no. This is what I want. This is what I prefer. This is what I desire. This is what I will, that all those that you gave me will be with me forever. And the reason I want them with me is because them, I love them so much. I want them to see me in my glory because it's their glory to see my glory. Now this request is incomprehensible to us. There's nothing like this in any account of Christ's prayers at other times or other occasions. When he prayed in his agony, there was no hint of any I will, but Father, let this cup pass from me if 
you will. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And note the amazing difference between Christ's way of praying against his own hell and his praying for our heaven. When he prayed for himself, it was, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But when he prays for his people's heaven, it is, Father, I desire that they may be with me where I am. When he was dying on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And just as he died, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. All those are humble requests. None of them are so lofty as this, I will. Now let's look at the two words in Christ's prayer, I will. Christ himself only uses this phrase once, and it's right here. And when Christ says to God, I will, he displays his divine glory because that's not a statement any of us could make. Christ had promised in John 14 that where he was, there his people would be also. And so here he prays for what he had already promised. I can't even imagine the confidence that Christ had in pleading with his father for the fulfilling of all his own promises to his people. But all Christ's promises were to his people were made by him in his Father's name. So it's no wonder that the Lord says, this is what I desire, because I know it's your will. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name, by the way. It's not some magical little tag that if you don't pray it, the prayer won't happen. Oh, that prayer didn't count. You didn't say in Jesus' name. No, to pray in Jesus' name means I'm praying this because I believe it to be God's will. Otherwise, I wouldn't pray it. Here our Lord is making his will. He's making his last will and testament and praying it over to his Father, which he had sealed the next day with his blood. And here he tells what he wills to his people. I don't know if it's the case anymore, but you remember some of you slightly older folks. When you got your yearbook at the end of each year of high school, you passed it around, and on your senior picture, you had your will. I will my locker to so-and-so. I will my fancy thing to... This. this is what Jesus is doing. This is his will, that they may be with me where I am. What could possibly be greater for Jesus to pray for? I mean, this is better than streets of gold, folks. This is better than seeing Grandma again. You're going to see Christ face to face in all of his glory. I mean, wouldn't you consider yourself blessed to have something like this bequeathed to you? We actually do in Luke chapter 22. He says, I appoint unto you a kingdom. That is, I bequeath it to you, I dispose it to you, I give it to you. The Lord had the price of his glory in his hand, ready to lay it down, and so he demands the purchase. He was taken this night, died the next day, and that's the price he was required to pay for our salvation. When you talk about salvation, we often say it's a free gift. Well, it is to you. It is to me. It wasn't to him. It wasn't free to Christ. It cost him everything. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, during World War II, wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. He said it cost God everything to redeem you, and it will cost you everything to be redeemed. It was a price agreed upon in the everlasting covenant, what theologians call the covenant of redemption. It was a price of infinite value, a price that the Father's wisdom and justice demanded, a price the, prom the Son promised to lay down. That price is now in Christ's hands and is ready to be laid down. No Christian should ever have feelings of low self worth. What did it cost God to redeem you? 
the life of Christ, one-on-one. -on -one. I'll trade his life for your life. What an insult to God to think or say, I'm not worth much, unless you don't think the life of Christ is worth much. No wonder in Christ demands the purchase in these assertive wills. I will. This I will is but an echo to the known will of his Father. Christ knew perfectly that the thing he was praying for was and is the will of his Father. This shows how much his heart was set on the eternal happiness of his people. And he prays for it literally with all his heart. Christ said, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am straightened, that word literally means in pain, until it is fulfilled. Life on earth was painful for Christ. Mainly because he would rather be in heaven with his father. So would I. Peter kept wanting to get in the way of that. Oh no, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen. Get out of the way. Luke 22, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So love for his father and love for his sheep made the Lord long greatly to pay the price of our redemption. His will was focused on the end itself, eternal glory. That was first in his design, it's last in our enjoyment. He wants his people with him where he is. Let that thought stir us up to praise him more than ever. Now the believer is saved and yet he sinks and is overwhelmed in all of this. He cries out like the Apostle Paul, Oh, the depth, both of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. When faith gets a view, of the unsearchable riches of God's grace in, by, and through Jesus Christ, the believer longs to be in heaven to behold the fountainhead of all grace and glory. Again, to stand before the throne in the presence of the Holy One. There's one noteworthy thing about true faith. It wants to stop being faith. It says with the hymn writer, and Lord, haste the day when my faith shall turn to sight. The true believer says with every breath, I want to stop being a believer. I want to be a seer. I long for the day when faith shall become sight. I long for the day when the veil is taken away and I can see it all clearly. I'm longing for the day when faith and hope are gone and when reality and sight let me see all that God has in store for me. I want to be with Christ where he is. I want to see him as he is. I want to see his glory. Think of that verse that Paul writes. Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, nor is it entered into the thoughts of man all that God has for those who love him. In other words, you can't imagine. Or if you can... If you translate the literal Greek, it is, you ain't seen nothing yet. Christ will mend us before he takes us to heaven. And it's a great work to make you fit for it. It's a work that only he can do, but he gladly does it, and he easily does it. We read in Luke 15, there's joy in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How much more joy will there be when all Christ's children are brought home to his Father's house? I mean, think how glorious it will be in heaven when Christ stands before God and says, Behold, those whom you have given me. Hebrews 12 tells us that Christ laid down his life, quote, for the joy set before him. That's the joy. To see all of his children brought home. It will be the wedding day for him and his church, his bride, and there were never such lovers as Christ and his bride. When a Christian kneels before Christ to receive the crown of glory that was purchased for him by 
Christ's blood that was shed in love, he will surely say, I am so glad for this day of finally receiving this crown. But you will not say it with any more joy than Christ will say, I'm even more glad to give it to you. There's a wonderful verse in Zephaniah 3.17. I noticed you were probably reading that just yourself yesterday in your Old Testament readings. <clears throat> it's a prophetic statement. It says this, The Lord your God in the midst of you is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. We think of that great celestial choir comprised of all the people who have ever be believed. I mentioned a choir of about 300. How about millions and millions and millions of believers come home to sing God's praises? What a glorious choir that will be. But the greatest singing in heaven will not be ours to God, but his to us. The day is coming when Jesus Christ will be as glad to see me in heaven as I could ever be to see him or myself there. He will rejoice over me with love. He will rest in his love. Literally, he will love forever. Without wearying or change, he will joy over me with singing. In other words, his love and his joy will break into singing. You know, one frown on Christ's face in heaven would put an immediate damp on all the joy there. But there's no danger of that happening. For when the imputed righteousness of Christ is on those who are glorified in all its glory, when inherent holiness is perfect in us, when we're enjoying communion with God in this paradise of God, then nothing that could hinder our eternal joy can enter into interrupt it. Not Satan, not temptation, not sin, not nothing like that can ever hinder. People ask me sometimes, what do you think the best part of heaven will be? No more sin. Wouldn't it be nice to have a day with no guilt, no shame, no hoping somebody will find out what they don't know now, or any of that stuff. Christ says that those who go to heaven will never go out again. A few years ago, my family had a reunion in Northern California where my parents lived. <clears throat> my dad passed away two years ago at the age of 95, 93. My mother's 95. She's doing pretty well for her age. A little frail physically, but pretty sharp mentally. I got a call on the phone, and it was her. I said, hi, Mom. Have you been trying to call me? No. Why not? <laughs> she still got it up here. You look up Jewish mother in the dictionary, there's her picture. But my folks are too feeble to travel anymore, so all of us boys, five of us, and our families converged on their house for a weekend. And we don't know if we'll ever be able to do that again. Well, certainly not because Dad's not there and my brother Dave's not there. But we're all getting on in years, and with children, schedules are always an issue. But it was sure nice to see all my brothers in one place, all five of us together. We had a good time teasing each other and hearing old stories. But after two days, it began to be a little sad. And the reason for that was because we knew the next day we'd all have to leave. And we don't know if we'll ever get to do that again or who'll still be alive for it. And as I said, since then, my dad has gone to glory. His family never said so-and-so died. They were all raised in the Salvation Army, and people didn't die. They were promoted to glory. My dad was promoted to glory and one of my younger, nice, younger brothers too. But one very nice thing about the family reunion in heaven, no one's ever leaving. When we get there, it's forever. No one's going to die, no one will leave, and no one will get on our nerves. 
All we will do is rejoice with God at this great homecoming. Remember how the song goes, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And where do all of these benefits come from? From the righteousness of an assertive Savior imputed to us, the same Savior who said to his Father, this is what I want. And when Jesus Christ asserts himself, knowing full well that his I will is also the will of his Father, then you and I can rest assured that the rest of the prayer is going to come true. God, Christ has never heard God say one time to him, no. He said, I will that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. And again, to quote the great hymn writer, love so amazing, so divine, what's the next word? Demands. It demands my life, my soul, my all. And this table, the sacrament of which we are about to partake, is meant to give us a taste of heaven. So let us receive it with joy and gratitude. Shall we pray? Father, we are grateful for this love that Christ has given us. May our lives reflect our gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen.